but the object for the whole goal behind NIT is to uh, essentially make a miniature star in the laboratory, to make a miniature star in the laboratory. You'll see inside a small gold can, and don't bother stealing it, it's not much value in that gold. Uh, and inside the can sits a small millimeter sized plastic shell and in this specific target we there is no deuterium and tritium but when we put it in front of the NIF laser we would have deuterium and tritium in that target isotopes of hydrogen and we would focus about one one and a half megajoules of laser energy in about uh, the total pulsing of something like 15 nanoseconds, 50 billionth of a second, you know, light will travel 15 feet in 15 nanoseconds. Is the red bundles there are actually 15 foot chunks of light. They're about 40 centimeters by 40 centimeters, 15 feet long, traveling at the speed of light through tubes. And they're shown as red because the color of the laser is actually infrared. It's just past the eye's ability to see. And it goes through a series of amplifiers that amplify the laser beam about uh, from nanojoules to megajoules, 10 to the 18 times. So 10 to the 18, that's actually a big number even compared to the, you know, to the deficit, to the fiscal stimulus plan in numbers. And then we bounce it off mirrors, put it through what you might think was magic crystals that change the color of the light from infrared to ultraviolet, focus it through laser, through optics onto the small target which is passing around you. And you notice the time in billionth of a second, you see the laser beams going in, warm up inside of that gold can to a few million degrees. X-rays get absorbed by the plastic shell in the center. And that generates an outward rocket pressure, which pummels the small shell inward. And after 17 billionth of a second, it really gets going, and traveling about a million miles per hour. And there you have it, a small star that lasts a trillion a second. With it, I will do it. Some people will say, you know, you're not going to make it happen on it. Yeah. I worked in this program for many years. We've done some experiments. I hate to say it this way, but I, I can't talk about all the details because they're still classified. But there is no doubt that we can make fusion happen in the laboratory. The trick has always been, can you do it with as little, not that, as little laser energy as one megajoule? Or would you need 10 megajoules? We think the NIF laser is big enough. So in about a year, maybe two years, as we fine tune the physics and understand it, we will get this whole lot of work to well, Once we have ignition on it, and he were to say, like Kennedy did in 60, 61, I think exactly, you know, we'll put a man on the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's something that we should do for ourselves, for mankind, for the nation. And Obama said, you know, we shall make fusion energy you know, in this decade. We could probably have a first prototype of this, maybe in, in eight years, but even that, you, know, you, you can't have it tomorrow. Five years, no. Because there are so many things that I know we have to do that are possible, that, how do you respond to some of the criticism that was sort of slightly mentioned in the piece? This was originally a $900 million project that turned into a $3.5 billion project. Um, <laughs> Eric, Eric, Eric sighed when I asked about money. But um, no, in these times, a billion may not sound like a, mo a lot of money anymore. But uh, how do you respond to the, some of the criticisms about that this is just too expensive and we shouldn't be investing in it? At this time. There, there are two things. One is you know, the, the justified criticism that when the project was, let me say, sold, okay, uh, back in the early 90s, there was some optimism and it was underestimated how the complexity of the to do it. And so that initially, you know, it actually was 950, I think it was 1.1 billion. That's, that's not important. And, and there was a lot of criticism and the, the project itself it was stopped for a while. It, uh, from politics, and it's actually doubled in price to about 2.1 billion, and that was the ongoing research program, which was always part to be part of the program, but now had to be counted as part of the overall, which is about 1.3 billion for three and a half. So you can criticize, absolutely, and you know we were underestimated by a factor of two in the project cost, 
And we lost a few years in the political you know, flap that followed that. Uh, but I think if you imply that three and a half billion dollars is too much to demonstrate fusion you know, on, on Earth that will power us for the rest of, of mankind's life, three and a half billion is nothing. I mean, it, it's well worth ten hundred times that price. I mean, it, it really is priceless. If you can find an energy source that uses water, right, and has no high-level waste and is inherently safe, I mean, the Chernobyl accident type syndrome cannot only not happen, it's, it's physically impossible with a fusion process. Okay, I do want to disabuse you of the idea that we're going to make small nuclear weapons and, and you know, set them off in the, in the NIF chamber. If you wanted to use NIF as a laser, as a weapon, you'd be better off picking up the building and dropping it on someone. I mean, it's, 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 no, I'm serious, it's just the wrong technology, the wrong everything for doing that. And also, what we talk about is the fusion situation. Now, we're not talking about making the fission bomb that sets as a trigger to match for the fusion bomb. So we can study the physics, the bits and pieces of the physics, to help people understand better how a thermonuclear device works. And that's actually rather important because you know, nuclear weapons are here. You know, they're not going to be wished away. They will be part of the U.S. deterrent for decades to come. They'll be part of the French and the British and other deterrent for decades to come. And maybe we wish they weren't here, but they are. And so, if and when, hope the day never comes, that the president or some other place needs to launch a nuclear weapon for whatever reason, he wants to make damn sure that it works. Otherwise, it's not a deterrent. You know, it's, it's so random and no one believes it, it's not a credible deterrent. In the days when you could test nuclear weapons on the ground, you, you could make sure that they were credible and reliable and safe and secure. That's no longer possible, the CPB test ban treaty. And so the confidence that the president would have on the safety, reliability, and security in the terrorist stockpile is the expertise of people, not like myself, because I'm not working in that part of the program, but like myself a little more, who have the expertise to do it. But if they can't test themselves by designing and testing weapons on the ground, they have to do experiments someplace and test their ability to think and understand and project how these weapons age and change over decades. And NIP is a place where they can do experiments that are related to effectively like an exam. You know, do these guys know what they're talking about? Okay. This is a cartoon, obviously, okay? Of something that is actually half the size of the NIP chamber, which is five meters in radius. This would be about five meters in diameter. Then you would inject, this is shitty resolution, I'm sorry for my language, but this little golden thing there, okay, would be one of these, okay? And it is injected into the center of the chamber, and then you fire the laser beam, which would be like the laser beams of NIF, at 10 times a second, and you inject these things at 10 times a second, and for each one, you get a burst that is on for 30 trillionths of a second, right? Let's say nanosecond. You can't use it like that in a nuclear reactor. You have to enrich it. And so you throw away most of it. It's called depleted uranium. It's not useful. You can't use it in a nuclear reactor. And the rest, you put it into a light water reactor, and you make 43 units out of 25,000. So nuclear power plants, are, they're great, they work, but they're extremely wasteful in energy. And that's because they're critical systems. And by the way, to make that ton of uranium I just showed you, you need to process 2,600 tons of rock. So it's a fairly messy process. And environmentally waste, wasteful. I talked about fusion. And so what we are thinking about, which is actually quite interesting, is, if I use this slide, this is meant to be sort of a pictorial diagram of the NIF laser, but I'm just showing one of the 192 beams. And this will be the NIF target you inject, and in the center, you make a lot of neutrons. That's what fusion gives you, a lot of neutrons. Now those neutrons will go through this blanket, through this wall, and then into a blanket. And then the magic of having a lot of neutrons is you can now choose the blanket you want for energy-specific missions. 
What I've talked about so far has been this lithium-based salt, which just heats up on the neutrons and makes electricity. You can also put in that blanket a coolant, and you take this depleted uranium, that was the waste stream from a nuclear reactor, that no one you knows used that. You can't do, use anything with it. It's just goes, it's low level waste, but it goes waste. You can put that in here. You can also take the spent nuclear fuel that comes out of the nuclear plant and put that in the blanket. So a version called a hybrid, because you use a fusion neutrons to incinerate, if you want, to make energy electricity from depleted uranium or incinerate nuclear waste. So we can take the waste products from a nuclear reactor, put it in this blanket, and get energy out of that way from fusion to give you a feeling for what you can do. The spent nuclear fuel that's just sitting around in cooling pools in the country is about 70,000 tons. That would generate 70,000 gigawatt electricity or something like uh, the energy needs of this country for about 150 years, just from the stuff that's waste. If you look at the depleted uranium, which we should throw away to generate the nuclear fuel for nuclear, that's about one and a half million tons. That's going to satisfy this country's could satisfy this country's electricity needs in this kind of a hybrid system for a few thousand years. So, what is the waste product from that then? That life engine that you're talking about? What is good, that? Good question. There's no such thing as a free lunch anywhere, right? This gets more complicated, but spent nuclear fuel has you generate about 20 tons every 18 months or so from a classic conventional nuclear reactor. Okay? It's high level waste. 94% of it is this depleted uranium, the stuff you haven't burned because you can't do anything with it in a conventional reactor. About 1.5% is plutonium and minor arachnides, and that's the bad stuff because not only is it radioactive, but if you took it out, you can make weapons out of it. So you wouldn't want a terrorist to get his hands on, on that waste. And 4% is highly radioactive fission products. If we take that, that nuclear waste as it is, or the depleted uranium, we can put it inside, as I this blanket, these pebbles. I'm not gonna give you all the details. At this point, you have to get, trust me that you, what I'm saying is possible, is possible, if you have the fusion neutrons. Because the fusion neutrons allow you to, to run this system in a deeply subcritical mode. Right? It's, again, it could never go critical because it's so far from criticality. And when you're done, you've taken 40, you've taken, you know, 40 tons of this stuff could give you a gigawatt electricity, which is the classic large power plant for about 50 years. When you're done, you have 40 tons of fission products. No nuclear, so no radioact, no plutonium and minor arachnides, so it has no value from a progression point of view. It does have fission products, but because, now it gets reasonably complicated, because that waste has no weapons attractive materials in it. The usual argument in this country against chemical reprocessing goes away. Because you can't reprocess, because you can't do it. We think you can be competitive with, with advanced nuclear, but to be competitive with coal on a pure you know, concrete glass, against, we're not gonna make it. So until you can have the dialogue change to where we as a people or the government, you know, when you are willing to say, uh, let me use the MasterCard you know, uh, commercial. You know, what is the price for ensuring that Florida does not sink underneath the Atlantic Ocean? It's priceless. But no one is willing to estimate the cost of that. But you know, if you continue with pump, pumping carbon in the air, it's not going to happen. So we have to find some way of capturing the real cost for society. Of, and and but uh, up until now, we're not there. I don't know. It's, we, we used people asked us uh, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago. Someone coined the phrase that you know, we're the cathedral builders of the 21st century. And what they meant by that is, you know, when when people build cathedrals in the Middle Ages, they knew that. They might not see the end. You know, it might be left for their their children to see. But it was it was worth it because the ultimate goal, in that sense, the glory of God. What we what we're doing is not far from that. And I think that you know the goal of making it happen is now within our reach, and that's 
Pretty exciting.